<clears throat> okay, so uh, today is the 20, 21st of December uh, 2021, and uh, is, is, is the day of the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere, because in the southern hemisphere is the, is the summer solstice. Uh, what is the winter solstice? Is uh, the time of the year when the night is the longest and the day is the shortest. And starting from today, the day begins to grow slowly. So light begins to win slowly the fight with darkness. Uh, I, I, I gather some materials connecting with the, connected with the winter solstice. And I will start with this um, uh, forgotten architect, but very important French Renaissance architect, Philibert de Lorme, who at Chateau de Toiry uh, created uh, an opening within the chateau through which exactly on this day, the day of the winter solstice, the sun rays penetrate the, 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 the castle. And it was done intentionally for a client who had uh, very sophisticated knowledge about such matters and who was sensitive enough to, uh, to try to connect his building with, uh, uh, with the sun. This was Philibert de Lorme and truly a very important French uh, um, architect of the Renaissance, a very interesting architect and he deserves to be known. Unfortunately, I think no school of architecture at all says anything about Philibert de Lorme. Sad. Here it is, a picture of, uh, of, of the chateau with the, with the sunlight entering through the building exactly on this day and only on this day, at the winter solstice. And this was done intentionally. This was not an accident because you see it doesn't enter through the left window or to, uh, through the right window. It enters exactly through the central door. In other words, the building says you are welcome, sun rays, or you are welcome, sun, S-U-N, not S-O-N. Uh, of course, uh, if you don't have a uh, metaphysical disposition, you say, so what? What's the relevance of this? Well, look, look at this picture. If this picture is not telling you anything, you know that, that the building is inflamed by the sun right at its core in the heart. You know, it, yes, for this, you need a poetical imagination and you need to vibrate, to, 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 to be moved by, by, by what is immeasurable, not by, uh, you know, uh, things that are uh, of a concrete nature. Although to me, this is concrete enough because it is uh, the, the building is animated in an almost surreal way by, by nothing else but the sun. Um, you know, this is how the building looks like, very old, no, from the Renaissance, French Renaissance. But look here, you know, all of a sudden, and I think in, in, uh, in, in a dialectical relationship with the building, the sun becomes even more precious. You know, you, you become aware of, 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 the, of the majestic sun even better if, you, if it is framed by a door or a window, like you, like you see here. And uh, it is this moment, it's for a short while, when the building seems to connect with the sun, and the sun seems to connect to the building. And I think this can be magical, and it can be magical only for someone who is open poetically towards what we call the environment, towards what we call cosmos, towards what we call what is outside of ourselves. And we should be very open towards what is outside of ourselves because as architects, if you are only concerned with yourself, it means you cannot, you cannot connect. And if you do not connect, I don't think you can build significantly. It's impossible. This is, this is the building, how it looks like, without the interplay with the sun on the, on, the, on the summer solstice, particularly during the summer and the winter solstice, because also during the summer solstice, 
I'm not sure. If, I think uh, during the winter solstice is at sunrise in the morning, and uh, when it is the summer solstice, it is in the evening and the sunset. Uh, the, the, the dialectical relationship between the summer solstice and the winter solstice is shown in, 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 in at the time of, of, of the day when, when this happens. Uh, I don't know exactly because I only saw pictures here with the sun rays entering the building at, uh, at uh, sunrise. Now, Studio Gang, and we had uh, the, the the privilege, I would say, to have Ginny Gang, who was the founder, is the founder and the owner of this celebrated architecture firm, contemporary architecture firm, with us on her very birthday in March 2021, when she spent with us almost two hours when I made a presentation on the works of Studio Gang. So Ginny Gang, she has four architecture offices, one in Chicago, one in New York, one in San Francisco, and one in Paris. And I will show a, a tower she built or they built uh, in New York, which is carved by, by the sun. That's how it is called, carved by the sun. It was uh, sculpted in a way by the sun, by the sunlight. Uh, not, it's not it's not explicitly or directly connected with the, with the winter solstice, but it is a work which shows um, uh, the awareness of the sun and uh, the interplay between the building and the sun. This is the building and you can see it, it used to be a, a prism which was cut. Well, she cut it, they cut it, Studio Gang cut it in this way. So the sunlight is reflected by this erosion of the prism right. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it is an homage to yes. the sunlight. Again, this work is not, I will show other works which are specifically related to the summer, uh, to the winter solstice. This yeah. is related yeah. to the sun and to the sunlight. Uh, please, yeah. be kind of, please be kind and turn off the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Unless you want to say something. Thank you. Yeah. So this is a studio gang in New York City, and it's a, it's a work that was uh, built uh, very recently. Maybe it was finalized uh, last year. So, you know, it is a glass prism, but the cut, the erosions, the geometrical cuts into the prism were done as an homage to the sun. And, you know, we cannot talk about the summer or the, the winter solstice without talking about the sun. The sun is immensely important. And in fact, you know, architecture gravitates around the sun. This is immensely important to know that if any project, a little, a little house or um, even a fence, an office building should take into the consideration the sun. And at, at the winter solstice, the sun becomes uh, very important because, as I said, from now on, the day is beginning to grow slowly. And the sun asserts itself more and more by having more and more light come to us freely. We are not charged for what the sun gives us. The sun gives us life, nothing else but life. Life would not be possible without the sun. Any plant, knows this, but I'm, I'm not so sure any human knows this. Anyway, this is a good building. You know, uh, again, you see it is eroded, so to speak, by, by the dialogue with the sun. And it's even called, it's, it's, it's curved by the sun. It, it shows, a, it's an homage to the sun, actually. It's, a, it's an im to the sun, an architectonic, gesture of, of thank you in a way uh, um, addressed to the sun. A good building by a very good architect, uh, Ginny Gang. And as I said, she was with us here in March this year and she spent, and you can see the recording of that um, uh, presentation on YouTube. Now, 
I will show some monuments, all the new built for the solstice, for the winter solstice. I took this material from a website I discovered from the Wild Hunt. And the text I am going to read was written by this person, Star Bostamonte, Bostamonte on December 19, 2019. So it was two days or I don't know exactly because it, it varies sometimes with a day or so. But it was before the winter solstice, uh, well, two, two years ago, yes, in 2000, um, uh, no, today, yeah, two years ago, uh, 2019. So uh, let, let me read, uh, because this is a relevant text. Many structures of the ancient world <clears throat> were designed to capture and reflect the position of the sun on the winter solstice in the Northern hemisphere and summer solstice in the Southern hemisphere, because today it is the winter solstice in the Northern hemisphere. And, it, and exactly today it is the summer solstice in the southern hemisphere and vice versa. When we will have the summer uh, solstice in the southern hemisphere will be the uh, winter solstice. The main chamber of Bruna Boen Boeni is filled with light when the sun rises on the winter solstice due to the specific alignment of a shaft within the structure. At Stonehenge, the rising sun during the summer solstice perfectly aligns to alight the center stone. But at winter solstice, the alignment occurs at sunset. During the winter solstice, sunrise at the temple of Karnak, the sun's rays shine directly between the portals of the gate of Nectanebo and lights up the sanctuary of Amon-Ra or Amon-Re, the, the sun god. Many pagans are familiar with well-known sites like Bruna in, uh, in Newgrange, this is in, uh, in Ireland, with Stonehenge and the Temple of Karnak. But there are a number of other sites all around the world built by ancient and not so ancient cultures. Um, now the temple, just a second, I thought I have, okay. I have uh, more text, but uh, after these pictures, <clears throat> the Temple of the Sun at Machu Picchu in Peru. Uh, here is a picture. You know, this, this kind of doing architecture is totally foreign to us because we are totally indifferent to cosmos. We are totally indifferent to uh, relating ourselves to, to the sun in this, uh, uh, you know, uh, mythical, uh, spiritual, uh, highly, uh, you know, uh, exuberant way. We, we don't have this sort of uh, relationship any longer because we are trapped in our little rooms. We have air conditioning, we have fans, we have TVs. We forgot about the, the sun and the cosmos and the sun rays at the, at the winter solstice and so on. But for the, the ancient civilizations, it was not like this because they were not laying on the sofas like we do watching TV all day long. No, they, had, uh, they were outside contemplating uh, the sky. So archeologists have identified, okay, archeologists have identified positions of the sun, uh, the solstices and equinoxes figure prominently in the construction of many of the ancient sites in Egypt and elsewhere around the globe. In Peru at Machu Picchu, the Temple of the Sun. Did I read correctly? Temple of the Sun. What is this? Are we thinking of building a temple for the sun? No way, you know. I mean, this kind of architectural program doesn't even cross our mind. What do you mean to, to, to build a temple for the sun? Anyway, so in, at Machu Picchu, the Temple of the Sun is one of its most recognizable and famous structures where upper windows placed in the east allow the rays of the rising sun to strike a stone considered by the builders to be sacred. What kind of language this is? What do you mean a sacred stone? Obviously, these people uh, didn't think they were very primitive. There is no such thing as a sacred stone, right? 
for us today, nothing is sacred, sacred, no stone, not the sun, nothing, except the toilet, the refrigerator and the parking lot, of course. Uh, I, yes, I am very in a negative mode because I, 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 I don't like my time and place. We, we desacralized world, the world and life in, 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 in terrible ways. You know, uh, anyway, less well known are the 13 tower solar observat 13 tower solar observatory that is part of the Chankilo ancient monumental complex found in the Kasma Sechin basin, basin of Peru. Researchers originally believed that they were remnants of a fort, but have since come to suggest they were more, more likely part of a place of religious significance as they align perfectly with the solstices and equinoxes. Again, the, the, this kind of thinking is totally foreign to us. What do you mean to align a building with the solstices and equinoxes? We do not understand such a language because we don't have such preoccupations, nor are we concerned with what is called religious significance. Uh, So um, Peru is also home to the mysterious Nazca lines and the Paracas geoglyphs. In November, another 140 designs of Nazca lines were recently reported as being discovered. The Nazca lines were discovered by this person on winter solstice on June 21, 1939. He realized many of the lines converge in intersections that pointed the way to setting sun. Stone lines were also discovered by scientists using 3D imaging to terminate the Cerro del Gentil pyramid, pointing the way to the exact place where the winter solstice sunsets. On the Yucatan Peninsula lies Tulum and Chicken Itza. A hole in the temple summit at Tulum allows the rays of the rising sun of the winter solstice to shine through, creating a spectacular starburst effect as it filters through the hole. The temple of Kukulkan found in Chicken Itza is often noted for the illusion of serpents appearing to climb its side during the equinoxes. However, on the winter solstice, it offers uh, uh, the sight of the midday suns shining brightly upon the southern and western sides of the temple while the northern and eastern sides remain hidden in complete darkness due to its uh, perfect alignment. Now the sun tunnels by Nancy Holt because Nancy Holt is, a, I don't know if she's still alive, a North American artist. And she created this uh, artwork, uh, which is a contemporary artwork where she aligned the cylinders with a with both solstices and with the both equinoxes. It's an attempt with the means of the present to pay homage to the sun in these four major moments of its apparent trajectory on the sky. So this is Nancy Holt, a contemporary North American artist. Then this place um, in Germany, Gossack Circle in Saxony, Anhalt, Germany consists of a series of concentric rings. The largest out, outermost ring having a diameter of 246 feet, that's about 80 meters, has two openings that correspond to the sunrise and sunset of the winter solstice. And in France, there are the Karnak stones and the Gavrini megalithic cairn, which is similar to the Irish Newgrange. We are going to see pictures of this Irish Newgrange. It's a fa very famous place uh, in Ireland. Both the stones and the cairn, I don't know what this is, the cairn, cairn, are aligned with the rising sun of the solstice. Unlike Newgrange, the inner chamber is not lit by the light of the sun. So we are going to see a picture of this. I don't know exactly what this uh, uh, concentric, uh, uh, you know, poles uh, mean, uh, I read, but I, to be honest with you, I didn't quite understand. Anyway, apparently it's, it's connected with the, with the winter and the summer solstice. 
There are many more examples of ancient structures that were built to be in alignment with celestial events like the solstices. I like these words, celestial events, and I really think our architecture for most of the time, if not all the time, is totally uninterested in the, what is called here the celestial events. And unless we, we, we create and, and we meditate on the relationship between the earth and the sky, between the terrestrial and the celestial, how are we supposed to feel connected to what we call the environment? There is no way. The human fascination with the sun, the moon, and the stars is not something that has ever quite gone out of style, though, well, <laughs> whoever wrote this, uh, this text doesn't know uh, what is happening in some countries. Because in some countries, this human fascination with the sun, the moon, and the stars, in my opinion, is totally uh, up, uh, absent. Now, Stonehenge near Wellington, this is another Stonehenge in New Zealand, is a modern interpretation of the original Stonehenge. Completed in 2005, it was specifically designed with the site's latitude and longitude taken into consideration. Its circular design incorporates 24 pillars that create windows that allow visitors to observe stars and constellations of the southern style as they rise from the horizon. And here is a picture of this Stonehenge in New Zealand, not the one in Great Britain. It's a, you know, a contemporary variation, if you want. Uh, I only have this picture of it. Now, um, let's read a little further, a little too much text here. I don't like usually to read, but uh, the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles was built in 1997. The library was designed so that during the summer solstice, it was built by Richard Meyer, the sun coming through the central portion of a skylight aligns perfectly with a glass plate on the floor of the library. Then about Nancy Holt, we already saw her work with those four, uh, four uh, cylinders. Um, you know, I'm not going to read uh, what we already saw. Now, while not specifically oriented on solstices or equinoxes, this, this we, sh we saw by Ginny Gang, a studio gang, uh, this tower was designed in a way to follow the path of sunlight and maximize its effect while preventing blocking the light and views of the Hudson River and Manhattan from inside the structure. The building designers dubbed the process solar carving and named the high rise after it. Uh, I have to tell you in Manhattan also, and I was fortunate to, I didn't know about this, but yes, um, uh, during the summer solstice or the winter solstice, uh, at a certain moment, yes, uh, you can see the sun uh, at, uh, you know, at, uh, at, at the end of a, of a, of a, of a street. Uh, I, I discovered on the, on the web, a website that explained this, but it's a very elaborate uh, analysis or it was, so I, I couldn't incorporate it in this presentation. But uh, there was a play with words from Stonehenge and Manhattan, derived the word Manhattan's uh, Henge, Manhattan Henge. I don't know if uh, the planners of Manhattan did it uh, consciously, probably not or intentionally, but uh, you can find on the web images of this. Uh, now, um, I am going to show a building which was built just a few years ago in China, which is not explicitly connected with the winter solstice, but it honors the sun in, in, uh, and the movement of the sun on the sky in very explicit ways. These Chinese are very sophisticated and they were communists just like we are or were but they, uh, they moved far away from the so-called transition that we still uh, invoke. This is the building, how it looks from the top. So let's see again what it is. It's, a, it's an Ecotech Island Exhibition Center. Uh, and uh, the architects were these, uh, you know, mentioned here. Uh, and uh, so this is how the building looks from the top. And there are uh, penetrations of the roof 
that uh, connect uh, the interior of the building dramatically with the, with the sun at certain moments during its uh, trajectory on the sky. This is the building and it's just the first building of a, a cluster of buildings, uh, the Echo City, they call it. They take their role seriously, you know. Uh, I admire the Chinese for this, you know, from a, from a country which was, uh, you know, as we know, uh, dominated by a very stringent and rigid and even deadly form of communism. It, it emerged now as the, the, the ultimate laboratory of research and experiments in the field of architecture and probably not only in the field of architecture. Um, okay, so anyway, this is uh, an interior which maybe is not uh, neither too spectacular or too connected with our topic, but you see these, um, these uh, uh, penetrations into the roof that channel the, the sunlight into the building at certain moments and in certain places. You see them here. These are homages to the sun. They, 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 they bring the sunlight in and we are going to see a little bit later uh, other examples where this connection with the sun is dramatized, dramatized arch architecturally uh, in explicit ways. Yes, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the opening in the roof for the sunlight to enter the, to enter the building, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a conscious way. And there are various penetrations into the roof that per permit this to happen. Because essentially the, the winter solstice and the summer solstice and the two equinoxes, when the day is equal, so essentially there are four major celestial uh, events. The equinoxes, when the, when the day is equal to the night and the solstices, when uh, the, either the day is the longest and the night is the shortest, like the summer solstice and vice versa, when the night is the longest and the day is the shortest, today for us in the northern hemisphere and this is this is uh, this is what is happening today we have the longest night and the shortest day and from tomorrow the day begins slowly to grow for the so called primitives they saw that the spring was announced starting with tomorrow because the day keep keeps growing from tomorrow but today we still have the, the longest night you see here, the sun, the sun, I mean, if you walk through this, you know, it's impossible to miss. It's, it, you'll be flooded at certain points, at certain times with, with, with sunlight, filtered through the roof into the building. And this, uh, this is a future development with the pavilions for research and so on. Again, China is taking its, its role in the world very seriously. And I think, uh, already what they achieved in, uh, in a very, very, very short time is, is amazing. Here you see, you know, two sections you are going to see at uh, two different times. And I, I would say this, the suggestion of this work is that we should also, as Mircea Eliade said, briser le toit de ta maison, break the roof of your, of your house, of your home uh, or your building in order to connect with them, uh, well, maybe he had in mind something beyond the physicality of the sun rays or the rain or the snow, but essentially it's about the vertical dialogue, uh, the, in essence, with the divinity. But then what is the sunlight? Many religions identify the sun with God. You see that this building is communicating with the above, is communicating with the sky, with the celestial events. It's, it's opening up, it's porous. Now the winter solstice bonfires, many cultures in the past, but also in the present have bonfires. What are bonfires? When they lit up certain structures as a celebration of the winter solstice with fire. 
and uh, we are going to see some of them. So a winter store solstice at uh, this place, Vela Baja, Baya. You see people sit in a circle and they contemplate the fire. Um, they, they move me these scenes, you know, because you know, fire is also sacred, you know, maybe indeed it was stolen from the gods by Prometheus in the European, uh, uh, you know, civilization or culture, uh, but uh, the f fire itself is a symbol of, of the sun and uh, without fire you cannot have uh, life and fire is, uh, for architecture is considered primordial because Godfrey Semper was right when, when he imagined the first hut being built in this way with some hunters or fishermen uh, around the fire. They didn't yet have a home built because Godfrey Semper asked himself, how did the first building ever built come into being? And he said, well, some fishermen and uh, hunters, they gathered around the fire and they didn't have a home, they didn't yet have a house, but they understood they have to protect the fire. And how to protect it? They didn't have tools to cut down trees to build a building, but they had their own hands, their own arms. So they moved, removed um, branches of bushes and trees, and they, through weaving, they created some panels of vegetal material which became kind of walls enclosures and then in time you know they built a, 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 they elevated a little bit the, the fire from the, the earth to protect it from animals and floods and then um, so the first thing was fire or the hearth in romanian vatra vatra case the first thing fire the second one was uh, the enclosure, textiles, the weaving, the, the, the vegetal materials. Third, uh, ele elevating a little bit the, the, the fire from the earth to protect it from animals and, and, and floods. That's uh, stonework. And then in the end, the roof, carpentry, the four elements of architecture. What we see here, these are vacationers. They are not uh, hunters or fishermen, but vacationers contemplating the, uh, the fire at the solstice. Here are other, you know, uh, you know uh, people gathering around the fire and in, in various cultures, perhaps also in Romania, uh, in some villages which didn't lose connection with the mythological, uh, the, the pagan um, primeval past, it's possible that such events uh, still occur, bonfires. Um, and, 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 and this was done often, if not always, at the, at the winter solstice, maybe also at the summer solstice, I don't know. But uh, at the winter solstice, it was done and it continues to be done. And it is moving because it is in a way a, a, a hello that human beings address to the sky uh, and implicitly to the sun through, uh, you know, uh, letting fire uh, manifest, uh, you know, the, their homage. Um, what saddens me is that, that in architecture, we are not aware any longer of the importance uh, of, of the winter solstice and the summer solstice and the equinoxes. We do not pay attention any longer to the, to the uh, mystery actually of the, of the celestial events. Uh, and uh, I think this is a great loss. But maybe we can reanimate the, the inner fire. The inner fire about which Emil Choran had some beautiful words, which I read before, but I will read again uh, now. Uh, I think after this image. Yes, uh, Emil Choran wrote in a very exalted and exalting way about fire. 
So uh, please allow me to read. I, I read this before, but uh, I, 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 I choose to, to read it again because it is connected with the, with the, with the winter solstice in uh, maybe uh, in indirect way, but I think in a significant way. The beauty of flames lies in their strange play beyond all proportion and harmony. The diaphanous flare symbolizes at once grace and tragedy, innocence and despair, sadness and voluptuousness. The burning transcendence has something of the lightness of great purifications. I wish the fiery transcendence would carry me up and throw me into a sea of flames where consumed by the de their delicate and insidious tongues, I would die an ecstatic death. The beauty of flames creates the illusion of a pure, sublime death, similar to the light of dawn. Immaterial death in flames is like a burning of light, graceful wings. Do only butterflies die in flames? What about those devoured by the flames within themselves? A beautiful question at the end. What about those devoured by the flames within themselves? And I would, uh, I would ask in a, in a, in a little bit uh, a, a change form, what about those devoured by the flames within ourselves? Uh, and now I'm going to show you a project I did for a bonfire uh, uh, for, uh, I think it was for, um, for Iceland. Uh, I, I worked uh, on this with, uh, with an Egyptian architect who helped me uh, model uh, this thing uh, with, uh, with uh, Maya. And uh, on the left is the, the text I just read. And this was supposed to be, um, uh, yes, a, a bonfire, um, which was to be created by these uh, elements mimicking bones, but mimicking also uh, the vegetation, uh, the, the uh, subaquatic vegetation in this area. So this was supposed to be made of these things solid and uh, indestructible by fire. And then on the day of the winter solstice or, or the day when the bonfire was supposed to be activated and, and uh, put to light, uh, to flames, uh, vegetation material would be inserted in this and when you lit this thing you know that vegetation material would burn but this thing would still remain as as, as you see it here anyway that's that's what you did uh, that's what we did you know five meters tall and uh, three meters and a half uh, three meters and six uh, approximately uh, wide and this would have been the um, you know, the, the setting for this uh, bonfire. And uh, we just saw that bonfires are lit on the winter solstice, meaning uh, on this day uh, of December. Now I, I'm going to show this famous uh, place in Ireland. Uh, I don't know exactly, I don't know if I have here text uh, when it was built. It's, it's uh, probably from before Christ, it's this mound and the, the winter solstice, the light of the sun, I think at the sunset, uh, the sun, uh, uh, sunrise enters, enters this, uh, this mound, you see, and it reaches its deepest uh, point. And this was done, uh, this was not an accident, you know, it was done and it only happens on the on the in the morning of the uh, winter solstice. So these so-called primitive people they had very sophisticated knowledge. You know they didn't have TVs, they didn't have cars, they didn't go to the moon, but they observed the celestial events and they responded to the celestial events in the way they thought was appropriate. So it moves me this, you know, I mean, look at this, you know, it's almost magical. These people with stones created a setting for a dialogue between man and the sun, between man and the sunlight. And uh, it's, it's about consciousness as well, because these people show to the sun, so to speak, 
that they were aware of its apparent movement. Maybe for them, it was not apparent. They believed in it, in, in, the, in the movement of the sun on the sky. It was their way of, of establishing a dialogue with what was above them. And, uh, you know, I, I so regret that we don't have any longer this, this longing for connecting with cosmos, with what is, what is not ours. Uh, I think it's a great loss. So this is uh, this place in Ireland. I understood that recently they discovered other mounds. This is very famous now, and there are many tourists visiting and so on, uh, because it is magical, you know, that moment when truly you feel connected with the sun, with the mysterious sun, with the sky. And look at this, the, it, it's, it's like the, the sun ray is, is reaching you. It's, it's like, uh, you know, extending its hand, so to speak, towards your hand, it is saying hello to you. Now look at this, you know, why, why did the so-called primitive man adorn the rock with this ornament? Because it is an ornament. And why is it that we neglect totally the ornament today? Why? Anyway, um, so look at these people, you know, they, they stare at the, at the sun ray in, in, in where, you know, they, you would say, why, why do they do it? Well, because it, they feel connected, they feel connected with what is not theirs. We are not, we are all limited, we all live a limited life, shorter or longer, but we will all die one day, but somehow this sun ray which enters as a winter solstice, this uh, monument in Ireland, makes you believe for a short while that you are not alone in this world. And this means something, it means a lot actually. That's why these people are here and you'll see others in Egypt. Now, not just in Egypt, look at this section through the Pantheon in Rome where it's possible that uh, the emperor uh, Adrian uh, had a role even as an architect. You see here the winter solstice, a 24 degrees of the light at the winter solstice reaches the dome exactly here. And you see, it's not a, it's not any place. You see the, 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 the architecture of the dome changes from this point downwards or from this point upwards. It shows, and, and uh, you are going to see also uh, the other moments. Uh, just a second, let me. Uh, you see here, uh, you, we saw the winter solstice. We see the equinox. We see the summer solstice. So we have, there are two, of course, there are two equinoxes, uh, the summer solstice, the, uh, I don't know what is at April 22nd, at 60 degrees when, when the sun rays, uh, if there is sunlight, uh, of course, uh, uh, reaches the very entrance into the Pantheon, the equinox, at uh, the equinox, it reaches the, 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 the altitude at which the dome begins. And uh, uh, the solstice, I'm not sure what is happening here, but uh, this is also, I think, important. Maybe there is something on the floor. Anyway, the winter solstice, the equinoxes, and the summer solstice. And I don't know, the summer solstice is not at April 21st. Uh, I don't know uh, what this is, the April 21st. It's close to Easter, but uh, I don't know. I have to double check this, but nevertheless, uh, there are studies showing that uh, the architecture of the Pantheon, uh, and these are not just uh, you know num numerical speculations. There, there are realities here. You know, the winter solstice uh, uh, strikes the building. The winter solstice light strikes the building at a certain um, with a certain de degree. Uh, the same, uh, the summer solstice and the equinox. So all in all, I, and uh, Emperor Adrian was a very learned man uh, and a very sensitive man. It's possible that the Pantheon uh, represents this connection, this dialogue with cosmos. Uh, and uh, let's see what else do I have here? 
The winter solstice at Karnak. Now we are in Luxor, at Luxor in Egypt, uh, where also the builders of, uh, of the temple in uh, Luxor at Karnak uh, aligned. You see the light, uh, the winter solstice is entering the complex of buildings in a certain in a, in a, in a obviously uh, uh, search for way. And, uh, you know, you, you might say, okay, uh, maybe it's just an accidental uh, symmetry or an accidental alignment. Well, people who study these things uh, think that this was not accidental at all. And uh, it happened in various cultures. Why is it that just on a specific day during the year, it has 365 years, why is this happening only at the winter solstice? Why? There must be a reason. And that's why many people gather here and you are going to see them. You know, again, you say they are naive. What, 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 what do they expect? Well, nothing really happens except that if you have some reverence towards the majesty of the cosmos, of the universe, the mystery, because we still don't know, you know, we are, we are small entities on a very small planet, you know, in the darkness of the sky. And, and here you have in such short moments, you feel connected with what is outside of you. And I think this is important. And that's why these people, you know, travel from far sometimes in order to be on the winter solstice or the summer solstice or the equinoxes inside, look at them, you know? It's truly a, a spiritual and a religious, uh, um, uh, you know, event. You know, it's, it's not of a material nature. It's, it's literally of a psychic nature, of a, of a, uh, of a spiritual nature, but but we cannot neglect the spiritual side of of, of life and of, of of human life as well. It 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 is real. It exists. And now, uh, Egypt's Karnak temple was built in alignment with the solstice, in order to focus light on a shrine to the sun god. The Egyptians, of course. Uh, we uh, we had a reverence for uh, uh, for the sun, at least uh, you know uh, in in uh, in uh, Ignaton's uh, uh, you know conception that uh, was the only god. You know the he believed in monotheism. He believed in the sun, although then he was dethroned by those who believed in polytheism. Um, so here they are. <laughs> At the winter solstice. Now, of course, uh, the authorities speculate this moment because there are people from all over the world gathering here and those flags and so on. It's, it's a ceremony that also brings in money because, uh, you know, you have tourists and so on. But, uh, but essentially what brought these people together is this magical moment when you know, after a, a year when this didn't happen, all of a sudden it happens. The sun strikes the building, strikes these very old temples at, in Luxor, in Egypt, in a, in a identifiable way, in an explicit way of some kind of a, uh, you know, conjunction. You know, we, some people still believe in the alignment of the stars. Now, in certain uh, special uh, conditions, which are, you know, uh, auspicious for, uh, you know, certain events and so on. Well, here is an alignment between the cosmic forces and the human forces. The building was built by the humans, but the sun was not, didn't come into being because of the humans. So there is a conjunction between the, between the two an alignment between man and God, if I am to express myself maybe simplistically, but more directly. You see here, the 21st of December, that is today, winter solstice sunrise at Karnak in Egypt. And look here at all these people waiting, waiting to be allowed, I guess, to, to, to enter the precinct and, you know, between these majestic lions 
and move towards that place where they can encounter the sun. And you see, this is a very recent picture because the people are uh, masked. So the pandemic is still with us, but people still gather here, risking even to get infected by COVID. They still want to say hello to the sun in this way. And you wonder why? Well, because, because fear is banished. In that moment when the sun is saying hello to you, I'm expressing myself in a naive kind of poetical way, you feel less alone and you feel empowered and you feel, yeah, you feel less afraid. I think it's about that. You feel less afraid. Thousands of people gather at Stonehenge as well to celebrate the winter solstice. Here they are. Why do they go there? For the same reason. You know, uh, uh, you could call them naive uh, if you are cynically oriented, but I think there is something genuine in this interest of many people to, uh, you know, connect with what seems so distant and actually with, the, with nothing else but the source of life, because that's what the sun is, the source of life. The source of life is not the refrigerator, is not the parking lot, is not the, <laughs> I should continue. No, it's the sun, S-U-N. And we are looking at it right now and it is majestic. Too bad we lost the, the wisdom of those so-called primitive people because they think they had the wisdom which we don't have any longer because we are too arrogant. We think we know a lot. What do we do? One day we'll be dead. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, without uh, allowing uh, deeper feelings to manifest themselves. And that's a loss. Now the museum, now I'm going to show a work in, in Japan, a modern work. It's a museum, uh, Museum Odawara Art Foundation, and they built an observatory with a specific structure uh, for the winter solstice. You are going to see it. One, the, one of the most photogenic spots is the winter solstice observation tunnel, which is some 70 meters long and literally ends in thin air. Yes, it's the winter solstice observation tunnel. Here it is. Uh, <laughs> You know, you, you remember some of the things we saw before, you know, including those cylinders by Nancy Holt and other things. You know, it's again, it's a gesture of awareness. Of, I put it maybe in, in a naive way, saying hello to the sun, allowing, absorbing the sun. Maybe you say in a rather childish and egocentric way, we want to absorb you, the sun, all of you. And so this, this channel was built oriented towards the sun at a certain time during the winter solstice. It's, it's just like uh, in that place in, in Ireland, but this was done by modern men in Japan, not in Ireland. And when, when the sunlight strikes it, uh, you have the same uh, feeling of, of being connected with the sun, with light, with life with the origin of life, essentially. And look at this, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, done with modern means, but uh, in a similar way to what, uh, you know, ancient uh, civilizations did, conceptually speaking. And I think this is the last image of this imperfect and short uh, introduction into a, a subject which deserves uh, more uh, more study and more attention and uh, an amplification of, of, uh, of examples because truly the winter solstice is immensely important. If you do not vibrate to this mysterious moment during the, the year when the night is the longest and the day is the shortest, then um, I'm not even sure if you can practice architecture properly. Thank you.